Hello everybody, today on the channel, the long-awaited update on my MGZR, and definitive proof, as if it were needed, that I am certifiably insane. You find me at the workshops of Classic Car Solutions, a firm based over in Luton and run by a refreshingly young team, headed by a lovely chap called Aaron, who's actually brought a couple of cars to the channel, both bright yellow Fiats, first an Abarth 595 and latterly his Barquetta. For a little while I've been on the hunt for somewhere to take on a bit of a project, and I don't know quite why, but it took me ages to even think of asking him. Knowing that he ran a classic car restoration business, I just hadn't really put two and two together. And then I approached him and said, uh, how do you fancy tackling something that might be a little bit different? And he was more than happy to take on the task. I suppose the reason it likely took me so long to make the connection is that when you say classic car, most people think of stuff like this gorgeous Aston Martin DB6 Vantage, the Fiat X19 I have before me, the Volkswagen Beetle next to it, or the Lancia Fulvia next to that, and the Jaguar E-Type over there. You certainly do not think of late 90s and early noughties Rovers and MGs. Cars like that, my 2001 MGZR, that I bought about a year to 18 months ago, shortly after having bought an MGZS, and then latterly completing the trio with a ZTT. Now I knew from the off that this was going to be a little bit of a project. However, like my ZS that I've recently done another update on, it turns out that it's a lot more of a project than I thought it was going to be. There's a good chance you may already be familiar with this model, but if you're not, the ZR is essentially the sporting counterpart of the Rover 25, which was itself a heavy facelift of the Rover 200 hatchback introduced in the mid-1990s. It shares many components with the Honda cars of the day because Honda and Rover had had a partnership dating back a number of years. But this technically was as much Rover as it was Honda. The company was owned by BMW in the mid-1990s and then at the end of the decade sold to a group known as the Phoenix Consortium, who later turned out not to have the company's best intentions at heart. But they did do a few good things, including putting a bit of time and effort into the MG brand, which up until that point had existed really only as one car, the convertible F. The idea, I think, was to try and attract a newer, younger customer to the cars, because Rover at that point in time had an image of being very much an old man's car. The MGs, though, were aimed squarely at your younger, realistically, boy racer market. And so the ZR, ZS and ZT were born of their Rover counterparts, the 25, 45 and 75. And if just over 20 years ago you were a newly licensed tearaway looking for the ultimate in thrills at a modest price, you'd do hard to beat one of these. Available in a number of different guises, this one is the top of the line, the 160 VVC, with the same engine that later made an appearance in the Lotus Elise. Yes, it's a Rover K-Series, yes, they are famed for some issues, but they're also fundamentally good engines in what is actually a really good car. And if you read reports of the day, though the interior was never brilliant and the company already had a poor reputation for reliability, when they worked, they were a lot of fun. However, as the firm folded in about 2005-2006, it very quickly became something nobody really wanted to deal with. And as soon as the next generation of hot hatches arrived, these quickly became a distant memory. And the situation was so bad that I read an article from about four years ago saying that 80% of the Z cars, the R, the S and the T, were already gone, meaning that very, very few remained. I picked this one up because it is essentially the unicorn specification. It is the car that everybody wanted. A three door in trophy yellow with that 160 engine. More than that, this is an early car, a 2001, making it pre-project drive, a program that MG Rover underwent in order to try and cut costs and corners to try and make the cars a little bit more profitable. 
it didn't work, and all they really achieved was making the cars feel even cheaper and nastier than they already did. This also is an extraordinarily low mileage car with just over 27,000 on the clock. And that is why I was so keen to pick it up. Because honestly, you just don't find cars like this anymore. A low mileage MG is a really rare thing. But as I'll now show you, this one did come with a few tiny negative points as well. I had been looking for one of these for quite some time, but every time one came up for sale, it was either the wrong specification or upon even slight inspection appeared to be a very, very obviously bad car. So frustrated, I put a post on one of the Facebook MGZR owners groups saying, has anybody got a yellow 163 door they want to sell because I'd like to buy it? And a chap got in touch saying, yes, I've got this, it's available for sale if you want it. It wasn't listed publicly, and it was in fact part of a trio that he had, but for various reasons, he was simply unable to give it the time that he wanted to bring it up to standard. So I went, saw him, test drove the car very, very briefly, sort of around the block, tried to look at it, and I could see that it was certainly going to need a little bit of work. There was some corrosion on the arches and the like, the wheels were flaking apart, the tires were old, and I knew there were lots of things I was gonna have to do, but it was a low mileage car with a bit of paperwork too, and so I figured this is probably the best opportunity I'm gonna get to buy one of these that's actually a little bit special. The ever lovely Paul Roverman from the channel Project Nigel kindly came and drove me the 200 miles from my home to get it. And on the way home, I did discover the car had a few quirks, including some binding calipers, which I suppose was inevitable. Although it was only the next day that I realized things were wrong. Because where stuff like a binding caliper is the sort of thing that can happen when a car sits for a while, I didn't think anything would really be all that bad with it. It still had a valid MOT when I picked it up, so I foolishly assumed that it couldn't be too far gone. And then the following morning when I went out to see what exactly it was that I'd bought, I noticed the car had three flat tires. And this is significant because knowing the car had been stood for a long time and knowing it was on older rubber, the first thing I did when I picked it up was check the tire pressures and they were all perfect. So I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions on that one. After that, it then sat around for a long time. It went off to someone that was supposed to do a little bit of work to it, but he very quickly said, actually, this is too much for me. And then it wound up just sitting around in a dark corner where I couldn't see it until I got to the point where I thought, right, I need to deal with this. I got in touch with Aaron and he said, right, send it over. We'll get it on the ramp. We will do our cursory inspection, which we do for all of the cars that appear here and give you a list. And it's quite the list. It is divided into three categories. Green, stuff that does need tending to, but it's not really urgent. Amber, stuff which probably really does need doing. And red, stuff that should concern you and really should be tended to immediately. Let's get straight into the red, shall we? Both front brakes were seized, in brackets, because of this, they couldn't check if the front wheel bearings were okay. This is a frustration because actually, though most of the parts for these are still available, the front calipers for the 160 specifically are not. Handily, there are companies out there that will rebuild them, so this is, in the grand scheme of things, a minor issue. The discs and pads all round also need replacing, but again, I was very well aware of this, and in fact, I had already ordered them a few months back. The rear axle bushes are heavily perished. Again, not a concern, easy to sort. The rear damper bushes are also heavily perished. Yeah, fine, both rear dampers are rusty. Yeah, not an issue. I anticipated replacing all of the suspension anyway. All of the brake flexi pipes are rusty. That's again, an annoyance, but I suppose, not unexpected. Same goes for the uh, fuel tank straps up here, which are also rusty. And then we get on to the big bit. Both sills have rust, lots of it. And when we took the sill covers off, we realized how much there was. 
Again, there is some good news here in that you can still get many of the parts for these and it can be fixed. Both of the rear jacking points are, well, effectively gone. They exist, but in spirit only. The top radiator hose is very soft. The battery negative lead is fraying. The battery is also totally dead and the fuel tank itself is also corroded on the join. Yeah, it doesn't sound too bad when you read it through, but I will lay over some B-roll of what exactly we're looking at. And as you can tell, it needs help, doesn't it? On the amber list, we have a few more mechanical items. The car needs a full service, which I knew that it would. All of the belts need doing, all of the fluids, of course. The engine also has some oil coming from somewhere underneath, but exactly where we won't know until we run it a little bit more. The earth on the gearbox looks somewhat perished. Both lower engine mounts are also shot due to the oil in them. There are bushes up the front and all round really, which have play. Some of them are even power flex, and I think I'm gonna keep that because I like the power flex bushes and I can get some fairly easily. The rear axle is also rusty. The rear subframe is also pretty bad. And in fact, the rear subframe needs to come out in order to tend to the jacking points and the like. It's a big job. And then finally, we have the green section, which is some other small underbody areas of rust, the sort of stuff that can be just brushed off, treated and will be fine. The gearbox has a bit of play in it. The front subframe also has a bit of surface corrosion on it. The wings at the front are pretty bad, but actually very easy to get. And uh, well, it's not very clean and tidy. The paintwork is pretty tatty in places. There are parts that are falling apart and the interior needs just a little bit of attention too. And the problem is this all takes a lot of time the parts are not too bad, but there are a lot of them that we require and all in to get this car into the condition that I would like, the estimated cost is between 13 and 16,000 pounds. Now there are a few different ways to look at this. On the one hand, if this were a classic Ferrari, an Aston Martin, a, a Jaguar E-Type, and it was in this condition, and you were told it's only 13,000 pounds to bring it back to nearly good as new, you'd say that was the bargain of the century. But I know that you're not, because this is not an Aston Martin DB5. This is not a Jaguar E-Type. This is not a 911. Heck, it's not even a 914. It's a 22 year old MGZR. And this is where I am very grateful that the team here are chiefly young people for two reasons, really. First off, it means that for the next 30 or 40 years, if I need a classic car restored, well, I know where to take it. A lot of classic car businesses are staffed chiefly by older people who were young when these other cars were. But the guys here have enthusiasm about this. They have a desire to see it put right. And just in case you're thinking that that means I'm gonna get a free restoration. Uh, no, nothing of the sort. I am paying basically full price. They're knocking four quid an hour off the labor rate for me. And that is essentially the extent of it. But I know you're all sat there thinking, James, scrap it. It's too far gone. You pay two grand for it to spend another 15 on it. And at the end, it'll be worth what? Six, something like that. Just don't do it. And that's why I am. Now the rough price breakdown, in case you're wondering, it's sort of third. So the big bill is gonna be really for the welding underneath because they estimate that could be about 70 hours. And at the end of it, it is going to look nice. Then you've got about five to 6,000 pounds of paint. They gave me a few different options. I didn't have to spend all that much. But as we're gonna be replacing a few different panels and the like, I figured, you know what, I want it looking really, really good. And then much of the rest of it is just mechanical. To be honest, most of these out there now, I would expect want two to 3,000 pounds, which is gonna cover you for tires, brakes, suspension components, a full service. You can easily spend that amount of money on them. And I have kept looking to see if there's another one out there like it that maybe would make a better starting point, but there isn't. They do occasionally appear looking absolutely immaculate underneath, but they're also the wrong spec, the higher mileage cars, and I'm sure they're very good cars. And if you want one, you can just buy and enjoy now. That'd be the one to buy. However, this when done 
should be something a little bit different. This should be something a little bit special. And I know it sounds daft, but of all the cars in my collection, this is actually, when it's done, going to be the one I'll be the most precious about the mileage with. Because low mileage Ferraris are 10 a penny. Low mileage MGs, where I actually have a little bit of history. I've got the original invoice for this car. In fact, I've even got the original sales order. And the guy part hexed a Metro Vandem Pla with about 30,000 miles on the clock. And they gave him 100 quid. I suspect he was the sort of owner who wanted the nicest version of the smallest car and turned up at his Rover dealer with his old Metro saying, what is the new version of this? And they were delighted to flog in one of these when all the 17-year-olds uh, couldn't get insured on it. And it's gonna take a while. I might not even see this car again for the rest of this year. I'm hopeful that I will, but they're gonna fit it in as and when they can. And here's the truth of the matter. Every single time I've spoke to somebody and told them what I'm planning to do with this, they have said to me that I am crazy. And every time they say that, it spurs me on just that little bit more because there are so, so many other cars out there where 20 or 30 years ago, had you told someone you were gonna pay triple what it's worth on it, well, you'd have just been called insane and they would have thought you were wasting your money. Today though, those are some of the rarest and most collectible cars. Escorts, Capris, all that sort of stuff. And though I don't expect in 10 years this to be worth 75 grand, I think it will be worth a little more than it is. And more importantly, because I'm going to spend the money on it, which I'm able to do, thanks to the fact that you're watching this, I'll have saved it, which is nice. So there we have it, that's an update on the MGZR, that's why you haven't seen it for a while and why you might not see it for another while yet, but hopefully at least a few of you out there might think I am actually doing the right thing. In any case, I want to say a big thank you to Aaron and the team here at Classic Car Solutions for not laughing me out the door when I suggested that we get to work on it and to all of you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.